You're listening to The Itch, a podcast exploring all things allergy, asthma, and immunology. I'm your co-host, Courtney, a real-life allergy, asthma, and eczema girl. And I'm your second host, Dr. Payal Gupta, a board-certified allergy, asthma, and immunology doctor. Courtney and I hope to balance each other out so that we get you all the information that you want and need about allergies, asthma, and immunology. Finally, we're talking about how to treat atopic dermatitis in all skin colors. If you've been following this current atopic dermatitis in skin of color series in partnership with the Allergy and Asthma Network, you know we've talked about what atopic dermatitis is, how it's diagnosed, and strategies to keep your skin as healthy as possible. If you're just tuning in, you may want to jump and listen to those other episodes for a base understanding of AD in skin of color, because we have a huge amount of information to cover today, and we're not going to go over the basics. So if you want those basics, go listen to episodes one through three in the series. I know that there's a ton of different therapies available that we'll be discussing like topicals, oral medications, and injections. So Dr. G, where do you think it's best for us to start? Yes, we have a lot to cover, but I think we should start with topical treatments for eczema. The most commonly used treatments for eczema are topical steroids, and steroids help because they reduce inflammation and help the skin heal. We use topical steroids specifically when the skin is experiencing a flare and we need to get rid of inflammation and irritation. There are different strengths or potencies of steroids and your doctor will help you choose the potency based on how severe your eczema is and actually the area that you're trying to treat. So our general rule of thumb is that for areas such as the face, neck, armpits, groin, and other sensitive areas where the skin is thinner, we will choose a lower potency steroid. The rest of the body can handle a higher potency if necessary. What I'm hearing is that a topical steroid treats inflammation. And why that's important is, as we discussed in our first episode, inflammation is what causes those long-term skin issues such as hyper and hypopigmentation and thicker skin, which you said is much more common in skin of color. Yes. Let's recap this because I think it's a really important point. Discoloration in general is more common in patients with skin of color, and that's darkening of the skin or lightening of the skin. And essentially, the earlier we treat eczema with the appropriate medications, the less we should see those negative consequences. I know how important early treatment is, and sometimes I just don't do it because honestly, one reason I'm afraid of topical steroids and I'm afraid of becoming dependent on them. And I've heard other people are also nervous about topical steroids. Can you unpack where this fear may be coming from? So I completely understand the fear that people have with steroid medications, but there is a difference between topical and oral steroids. And I think that people group them together, which is the problem and which is what causes that extreme fear and anxiety. So oral steroids can have systemic side effects, which can be very dangerous. And we'll review those later in the episode. But with topical steroids, if you put them only over the skin where the eczema flares are and no more than twice a day and only for a short period of time, and use the right potency, the side effects should be minimal. And that's really our goal with therapy. So most of the time, the skin will improve markedly within a couple of days, just with bathing, steroids, and ointments. But sometimes you need to slowly taper the frequency of steroids to prevent the skin from flaring again. There is a risk of skin thinning and a change of color in the skin or an acne type reaction with topical steroids. But we generally see that if you aren't using the steroids as prescribed. If you see these side effects, it's best to stop the medication and talk to your doctor. Most of these things will resolve over time after you discontinue use of the medications. In addition, most of these side effects will present in more sensitive areas like the eyelids, face in general, and then the genitals. It is important also to remember to monitor the side effects from any medication that you use. And it's important for patients to remember that talking to your doctor to request a change in therapy earlier is better than later. 
So the bottom line is that we shouldn't really be afraid of topical steroids. And I can say that I overcame that fear and I have had the first few itch-free days in years. One big thing and one reason I had this fear is I've heard a lot about topical steroid withdrawal. This has also been popping up on my social media feeds a ton, and I think it's a contributing factor to this fear of using any form of medication to treat my atopic dermatitis. So can we just talk a little bit about topical steroid withdrawal? Yeah, so this topic is interesting. Withdrawal from topical steroids happens after using steroids for a prolonged period of time, which is considered two weeks or more. So it sometimes occurs after less than two weeks of use, but generally it's seen in patients who use topical steroids daily for two months or more. And we see a varying constellation of signs and symptoms, including erythema or redness, burning, stinging sensation, itching, pain, and facial hot flashes. And these symptoms occur days to week after steroid discontinuation and are more likely to occur on the face or genitals. As far as how long the withdrawal symptoms can go on, it's really variable. The skin can take months to years to return to its original condition, which I know sounds very scary. And then the duration of the steroid use may influence the recovery time. So patients who use steroids for a longer time, more consistently report the slowest recovery. Is there any way to know if this may happen to you? I mean, if you're tapering your steroid use and you're following everything correctly, is there still a sign that could tell you if you're going to have topical steroid withdrawal or not? Yeah, so there's no way to tell if you're going to get withdrawal symptoms, unfortunately. But I think that the rule of thumb is that it is best to use topical steroids for a short period of time and only in the areas that are necessary. And sometimes what happens is that patients come in after using the steroids for a long time, and that is when I try and have them start tapering. So tapering should hopefully prevent the occurrence of withdrawal. So again, not using them for consecutively for long periods of time and then tapering how you're doing it, meaning that you're slowly using a smaller amount, going from twice a day to once a day to every other day. That's what we mean by tapering. Following those kind of things will help reduce the possibility that you would have steroid withdrawal. Thank you for explaining tapering and why it's so important to do that instead of just stopping. Once your skin gets clear, you just stop your creams, but why you have to continue even though your skin looks clear. I know it's very tempting to just stop. (laughs) I've had that feeling. I just wanted to ask you a question about something like hydrocortisone cream, because I know that that's an over-the-counter cream that you can just buy at the pharmacy or the drugstore. Yeah, so that's a really good point. There are topical steroids that are mild in strength and are over the counter, but you have to remember that it is still a steroid. We have to follow the same rules and make sure that we're only using them for a short amount of time. Using them intermittently is the best thing. Long-term intermittent use is something that we'll talk about a little bit later, but it just means that you are using them kind of consistently, but you have breaks in between. That same kind of rule of thumb should be applied when you're using even a mild over-the-counter steroid cream. Great. So I just would love to recap because I know that topical steroids are something that's always top of mind for people with atopic dermatitis. So what I'm hearing is that topical steroids come in many different potencies and that your doctor will help you determine which one is the best for you based on your specific case. We don't want to use topical steroids for a prolonged period of time, and they should only really be used on the areas that you have your eczema. Finally, we should not be afraid to use them because the earlier you treat your inflammation, the less you'll have long-term effects like discoloration or thick skin. I know that there are a lot of different options out there for topical treatments, not just steroids. What are the other ones that a doctor may prescribe? So in the last 20 years or so, we actually have a lot more medications that we can use for atopic dermatitis, including three classes of medications that don't contain steroids, which is super exciting. One is called calcineurine inhibitors. You may have heard of 
tacrolimus or prototopic and allodil or permicrolimus. There's also phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor, which is crisoprol or eucrisa. And lastly, the newest on the block are topical JAK inhibitors. So all of these medications are great in my opinion because they can help patients keep their skin healthy so that we don't need to use topical or oral steroids. So if you haven't been offered these medications, it's very important to ask your doctor or consult with a specialist to see if this might be an option for you. I think we'll list those in our show notes because those are some epic words that I will not remember. (laughs) So we'll definitely have those in our show notes. And since they're not steroids, which is really cool, what should people know about them? So for instance, should they also be used in short periods of time? And of course, what are their side effects? Yeah, so we can quickly talk about each of these categories, but they are all very different medications. For tacrolimus and permicrolimus, these medications can be used intermittently like steroids, but can also be used in what I was talking about in that intermittent long-term way, which means that we use them once a week in areas that are usually problematic for us and then continue that once a week use, but then there is like a big gap in between where we're not using them. You know, the most common side effects are transient burning, redness, and itching in the areas that you're using them in, but they've also been linked to cancer, but these concerns haven't completely been validated, and I've never seen it in my practice, but again, limiting the use to only select areas for short periods of time or using them only once a week to keep the skin under control are usually my recommendations, and again, the risk of cancer really hasn't been completely established. I use it on myself and recommend it all the time, but with anything, limiting its use is best and not applying it all over. For eucrisa or chrysoprol, this is more of a daily ointment that can be used to improve the skin barrier. It's applied twice a day to the areas that are affected by atopic dermatitis. It actually doesn't have too many side effects. Some people have burning with it and can't tolerate it, so they're not good candidates for it, but it isn't associated with any other larger negative side effects. And lastly, there are new JAK inhibitor medications that help tamp down your overactive immune system. So topical JAK inhibitors are used like tacrolimus and permicrolimus for short-term or long-term intermittent use. And again, like any other topical agent, some people don't respond well to these medications as others do, but in general, they are well tolerated. And I feel that in patients with skin of color, it is especially important to add in these alternative medications in between and during flares so that we can prevent the disease from getting to the point of a a severe flare, which leads to the skin discoloration and the thickening that we had previously discussed. So that was a lot of information. And again, we'll list all of those just because those names are hard to remember, but they're definitely something good to keep in mind to talk to your doctor about. Did we cover all types of topical medications then? Yeah. So I think we can move into oral medications that patients may be prescribed. Let's first discuss oral steroids since we've kind of already touched on them. So oral steroids, should be reserved, in my opinion, as last resort, but unfortunately patients get them prescribed often. And that happens more in the emergency room or urgent care centers, and also sometimes with primary care physicians. And that leads to patients over relying on these therapies. Oral steroids work quickly. They really feel like a miracle drug, but we now know that oral steroids have a lot of risks associated with them. You know, we do need oral steroid medications for many conditions, including atopic dermatitis, and especially when we're having severe exacerbations, they're absolutely needed at times, but ideally they should be reserved for very short-term use and not prolonged use and definitely not over and over again, meaning not weekly, not monthly, really just not even more than once a year and ideally not even once a year. It sounds to me like you should really avoid going to the ER as much as possible because they might not be giving you the right treatment and oral steroid, it might not be what you need. You might just need to be on a topical treatment. Is is that correct? Yeah. So essentially what I want people to remember is that the ER and urgent care centers are really there for emergencies. Things like not breathing well, having a finger chopped off, you know, lots of emergency kind of situations. And these doctors are really good at helping save people when they're about to die. And 
they are just not, however, trained on how to keep conditions under control. So that's not really where their training is focused on. And each doctor has a different type of training and we have to remember that. So yes, they will likely go to oral steroids because that is a medication they know will help the condition quickly. They also don't know many times other medications that are options for patients. And they also don't know your history. So they don't know how many times in the past year you've used oral steroids. And if you're experiencing side effects already from oral steroids. So there's lots of things that need to be considered when we're managing a chronic condition like eczema. And it's important to not rely on urgent care and emergency room centers as your primary source of treatment. I personally see my atopic dermatitis as something that I need to manage long-term because I never know when it's going to flare again. And that's why I would personally emphasize that having a good management plan and talking to your doctor about that is really important and that we shouldn't just put a band-aid on the wound, but we should look at how to heal that band-aid. That being said, I don't think we should go into much more detail about oral steroids because as you mentioned, they are really your last line of defense. Another medication that I've heard people being prescribed for their AD are antibiotics. Can you explain why we would be getting antibiotics for our skin? Yes. So antibiotics should also be rarely used in patients with atopic dermatitis, but they might be needed when the skin gets to the point of infection. So we want to remember that with the itch, scratch, rash cycle, we can also have another element to that, which is that broken skin barrier and dirty nails leading to infection. That's where we end up needing to use antibiotics. Yeah, I've heard of people getting staph infections. So this might be one of the reasons why they get staph infections with AD. Yeah, so staphylococcus, which is what staph is shortened for, is a common cause of these infections. We all naturally have bacteria on our skin. Again, sometimes we scratch so much that we can introduce a bad bacteria into an area where the skin is open. So you can get things like cellulitis, which is an inflammation swelling of the skin with redness, swelling, and sometimes even a fever with an infection. And then that can also lead to infections in your bloodstream, which can be very scary. You can also get more of a superficial infection, which is called impetigo. And the skin looks like it's got honey crusting over it and it's inflamed. We treat all of these with antibiotics, both topical and oral. And sometimes actually doing dilute bleach baths once or twice a week may decrease the need for antibiotics and reduce the incidence of these infections. I've definitely heard of bleach baths that work to eliminate the bad bacteria on your skin. However, I was always worried it would like bleach my hair. I can totally see why people might worry that bleach would discolor their hair or even their skin, but I want to calm everyone's fears. Bleach does not do anything like that. It can be used in all skin types and bleach baths are very safe to use. We haven't really gone into it, but we can put a recipe for bleach baths into our show notes. You don't use straight bleach on your skin you have to put it in a large amount of water. You put a small amount of bleach in a large amount of water, and then you know you only soak in it for a very specific amount of time. So we'll definitely outline all of that in our show notes, but I just wanted to mention that too, is that we're not putting direct bleach on our skin. And the reason for that is because it can cause burning and it's a very toxic substance. So it can't just be used directly on the skin like that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I just think of bleach and I think of that little skull with the crosses. <laughs> so having a bath in that just does not seem like something anyone wants to do. Back to oral medication. So I have been prescribed antihistamines for my AD. And this is more of a selfish question. Is that a normal part of eczema management? Antihistamines don't have a lot of good backing in atopic dermatitis, but first generation antihistamines, meaning the older antihistamines like Benadryl and hydroxyzine, the ones that can cause more sedation are thought to help more with atopic dermatitis. And I think that's mostly because they put you to sleep and you don't get bothered by the itching as much, which helps stop that itch rash cycle. Since antihistamines are relatively safe to use, 
I always do give them a try to see if it'll help with people's symptoms, but it's not a surefire way of getting rid of eczema. Oh, that's interesting because I've been told to take my antihistamine before I go to bed. Hmm. <laughs> that makes sense now. Are there any other oral medications that can be prescribed for AD or have we covered them all? Yes, actually there is a new kid on the block and it's the JAK inhibitor in the form of an oral pill. So this just came out this past year and we spoke about them earlier in the topical medication section, but they help tamp down your immune system. They are used for moderate to severe eczema where other treatment options haven't worked. They're taken once a day orally, but we do need to monitor blood work when you're on them. So that's something important to keep in mind. They have potential side effects related to infection, heart issues, liver issues. So it's very important to talk to your doctor to review all the pros and cons of starting any medication, but definitely for these oral JAK inhibitors. It sounds like these are really something that you would consider if nothing else works then. And to be clear, are the side effects the same for topical JAK inhibitors as they are for the oral ones? No, the side effects for oral JAK inhibitors are more systemic, whereas the topical JAK inhibitors are associated with less side effects. Okay, so it sounds similar to steroids in regards to the way that side effects work with oral versus topical. Now that we've hit upon all the oral medications, one treatment that I'm really excited to jump into is biologics. Can we, can we dive into those now? Yes, let's definitely dive into biologics. So first, what are biologics? They are medications that are unlike traditional drugs. Traditional drugs are made out of chemical compounds. Biologics are made from living organisms, and they basically block the immune response and help reduce the inflammation that causes eczema and eczema symptoms. For eczema, we have two different options for biologic treatment for patients with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. So the first one out was dupilumab or dupixent. And recently there's been a new one that has been approved, trilokinumab. All of these medications are really hard to pronounce or also called Adbri. And so dupilumab has recently been approved now for as low as six months of age and older. And trelokinumab is only approved for adults or 18 years and older. Both are given every two weeks in adults and dupilumab for infants and kids is given every month. Both can be given to yourself at home, but if you don't feel comfortable you can sometimes have the option of getting it in the office, but sometimes insurance can be funny with this and you may have to do it at home. Right now, we use these medications ongoing. They are not a cure. So technically when you stop them, your symptoms may reoccur. However, sometimes patients want to see if they can tolerate waiting three weeks or four weeks as an adult to get the medication and see if their symptoms are still controlled. And I'm always open to trying that because less medication is always the best. Are there side effects that we should know about for these two different types of biologics? Yeah, so for any medication, you can have a reaction to the medication like anaphylaxis, but that is rare and you don't have to carry an EpiPen around when you're on these medications. So what's interesting is that with dupilumab for atopic dermatitis patients, we see a severe dry eye as a side effect that doesn't appear in patients who are being treated for asthma, for example, with dupilumab. We also see a similar side effect for trelokinumab is that there is this kind of dry eye or this conjunctivitis that can occur within the eye. So with any medication, when patients have that severe dry eye, they have to figure out, is that dry eye so severe that they can't live with it? And there is treatment for the dry eye. So oftentimes I co-manage the patient with an ophthalmologist and they can get treatment for the dry eye and continue the biologic treatment. But, you know, obviously it's a conversation if the dry eye is more severe and more debilitating for the patient, then they might choose to come off of the treatment. Okay, that's good to know. It's good to know that the side effects are also something that you can treat and that it's not like two really kind of bad things that you're juggling, but it's, it's all doable. I know that we did discuss biologics with Shiv, 
Shiv has been contributing to this podcast series with telling us about her story of living with atopic dermatitis. She has a really good clip about her whole treatment process, but also about biologics. And we're going to throw that in here because not everyone can afford biologics and Shiv jumps into that in her conversation with us. So let's hear from Shiv and we'll talk a little bit more about affordable ways to treat AD. So I've been on topical steroids since I was a baby and I've only ever, I try to avoid oral steroids as much as possible. Only if I'm having very severe asthma, do I go on to oral steroids when the asthma pump is not working and I need to take something a bit more stronger. But a lot of the times, a lot of eczema treatments are really expensive. So my allergist recommended wet trapping to me. It's the most affordable treatment I've ever done. You start off by applying a thick layer of emollient, and I prefer using creams to lotions. And then you use a wet bandage or tight piece of clothing that will cover the specific area. You use another bandage or piece of clothing, but this one will be dry and you place it on top of the wet layer. I love this treatment because I was a broke student who saved up just enough money to see a specialist, but I didn't have enough for expensive treatments. So she helped me find a way where I can still try manage my eczema as well as keeping it affordable. So you've been on topical steroids, so the topical steroids, and then sometimes you get oral steroids for your asthma, which also helps your eczema. And then you said that you have the weeping type of eczema. So have you also been on a lot of antibiotics? Do you get infections frequently or how has that been for you? So I haven't had infections very frequently. The most recent one was when I was 18. I have have scalp eczema and I scratch it a lot and I get a lot of cysts all around my scalp. And uh, so I go to the doctor a lot to extract those cysts out and a lot. And then, so when I was scratching one of my scalp eczema, it got infected and had to go on antibiotics for that. But that's the most recent one. Other than that, I haven't had any infections. So this is such an important thing that doctors think about on a daily basis. We have to kind of juggle the medications that we know might help with also what is covered by insurance that the patient has and how affordable is the treatment option gonna be for the patient. And so that's really a juggling act that we have to do every day, I think for most doctors. And I really do love things like wet wraps because anyone can do them and they're very affordable, but we can see Shiv is very motivated and she's excited about doing things that might help her skin. And treatments like wet wrap therapy really do require a lot of motivation. I also wanted to mention that we don't recommend doing wet wraps when you use calcineurin inhibitors or phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitors that we talked about earlier, but it is safe to be used with a low-dose topical steroid or just those emollients, lotions and creams and like Vaselines and things like that. That's good to know. Again, we'll list those so you know what Dr. G is talking about when she talks about uh, calcineurin. <laughs> you see, I can't even remember how to pronounce it. Okay, I have one more question about other therapies that aren't medication, but that can help you. Because I've seen a lot about light therapy. Can you talk to us about what that is? Yes, there are studies to show that the use of phototherapy can help with adults. We don't use this for babies or kids. It's a treatment that is done with a doctor in a doctor's office. And we use what we call narrow band UVB. So it's a specific type of light that is different from sun exposure. The sun is made up of UVA and UVB rays. So it's not the same thing as what you're getting when you're getting phototherapy from the sun, for example. And what we know is that this specific narrow band UVB light is designed to reduce inflammation, lessen the itch, and boost the body's bacteria fighting ability in hard to control eczema. So it's important to notice that this treatment is can be great for some patients, but it can be cumbersome. You usually need to go in three times a week for it to be effective. And as we talked about before, we need to think about insurance coverage and Sometimes this treatment is not covered by insurance. 
And so I don't do this in my particular practice because it requires specific machinery that's very costly. So dermatologists usually have it in their office because they use it for other types of conditions also. Lastly, light therapy may cause hyperpigmentation or darkening of the skin in patients with skin of color. So that's also very important and very important to consider when we're talking about this therapy. Light therapy is not as easy as just going to the tanning salon. And it's definitely something you want to discuss with your doctor if you have skin of color. Yes. A tanning salon is definitely not the same thing as doing light therapy for eczema. (laughs) So very important to remember. And it's a totally different machine and a different type of light. So that being said, I know that there are a lot of machines out there that are being advertised for at-home use. And I really don't know if there's very rigorous scientific evidence behind those machines, because again, like I said, I don't do those myself in my office because the machines that you use are just generally expensive. And so I just want to make sure that people are wary and really doing their research before they spend their hard-earned money on things like that. Good to note, because I do see a lot of these different machines being advertised, especially on social media and Again, it's something that you should discuss with your doctor and, you know, not all of it is backed by science and you have hard earned money that you don't want to just like throw away. On that note, (laughs) since this has been a long episode, I just wanted to mention that our final episode, we're going to be talking about shared decision making and how to work with your medical team so that you can take what you've learned today into your next appointment and feel more empowered about managing your AD and having more of an engaged discussion with your doctor. So thanks everyone for listening and we hope that you've learned something new today. Remember, we have three more episodes if you listen to this and now want to know more about the basics on AD. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Remember that all information you hear today is for informational purposes only and are not intended to serve as a substitute for the consultation, diagnosis, and or medical treatment of a qualified physician or healthcare provider. And also, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. And if you have a second, help spread the word by rating our podcast and sharing with your friends and family who might also be interested in learning more about allergies, asthma, and immunology. You can always stay up to date by checking out our Instagram, The Itch Podcast, where you can leave questions you are itching to know, or check out our website, which is www itchpodcast.com, which contains more information about the subjects we covered in today's episode and every episode. Until next time, have a fabulous week.